Hi, everyone. I can't see you, but you can see me. I haven't put mine on. Sorry, everyone. Special occasion. You got to do your best. Yeah. Right, come on in, everybody, and welcome to our chat room. We will be starting in a few minutes. As soon as uh, maybe it hits 11, it's not quite there yet. And then we'll One give minute. it. Yeah, we'll give it. So if you need to go make a cup of tea to settle in for the chat, go and do it now. There's time. Um, or grab yourself a drink. And you might get hungry listening to us. So perhaps you'll need to uh, <laughs> something. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I was watching MasterChef last night for three hours. I watched, you know, the last week's episodes. And gee, it makes you hungry just watching all that cooking yeah. and the judge eating. And it's just like all you want to do is go to the kitchen and make something delicious. Start cooking. Yeah, at 11 o'clock at night. It's not a good idea. Yeah. All right. Okay. Welcome everybody who's coming in. I can see that you're coming in. I can't see who you are, but I can see you coming into the room. Oh, my mum's just tuned in. Hi, mum. Well done for working out how to get here. Hi. Hi, mum. <laughs> I can have a substitute mother. Um, and Sandra says she's it's working on her iPad. Okay, Sandra, did you do anything different to the computer to get it working on your iPad? And hello, Racheline. Nice to have you here as well. So all of you guys who are in the room, you can click on the chat thing and you can type your comment and you can either send it, you've got a choice to send it to everybody or to send it to the panel only, I think. So it's up to you. Hi, Poppy. Nice to have you here. Okay. Okay, so I think we'll start in a minute or two. Um, yeah. yeah. Linda said it's sad to not be able to see everybody else in the room. Yeah, it's an interesting debate whether we do these things on webinar cam or we do them on Zoom where you can see everyone. I also quite like to see people. So I'm not sure. I think we're just workshopping what the best thing is. So Sandra said she just logged in on her iPad and got on. So just didn't work for me. Presenters. Maybe it was the link as us presenters. Maybe. Maybe, maybe. Okay. Okay. So I think we should start on just checking in. I'm not messaging someone else, don't worry. I'm just checking in with um, the administrator whether we should start. <laughs> okay. All right, I think we'll start um, because it is 11.02 on my computer time. Um, and all of you were so punctual that we should really start and people that are late can just come in and catch up. I think that's what we'll do. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, really, really nice to be here. I'm sorry that we can't see you. Um, it's a shame. But I'm Lisa Goldberg and I'd like to introduce... Um, my sister, I was thinking about how to introduce you and I was thinking, you know, I could call you my sisters, my wives, my friends <laughs> and my colleagues and my co-authors. They're all of those. Natanya Eskin. Um, hi, everyone. And Marilyn Chalmers. Hi. Um, and hi, Esther. I can see that you're on as well. Lovely to see you. So thanks, everyone, for being here. And just a bit of housekeeping. Um, you can type your questions and comments where it says chat and 
you can send them to everybody or you can just send them to us and we'd love to answer your questions perhaps at the end or if they fit in as we're going along. Um, but we've got a really nice story to tell today. We wanted to do this event before Mother's Day because we were talking about mothers and grandmothers mm. and the passing down of traditions, but we didn't get it sort, you know, everything sorted in time. So we're just doing it now and we're very happy to be here. All right, so let's begin. I just want to introduce these girls properly. So let me just tell you a bit about Natanya. Um, she's born and bred Sydney girl. Um, she grew up on the north and then moved to the east. And she started her professional life as a school teacher. And I think like me, her passion has always been cooking and food. And she knew that um, every, it impacted every single part of her life. She's married to Guy and has three children, Oscar, Sophie and Sasha. And interestingly, Sasha was born in the first year of Monday Morning Cooking Club. So she has been with us all the way through. Um, Natanya was instrumental in starting Monday Morning Cooking Club with me. We were the two that had the very first conversation about it. Um, and we used to play basketball together. And if you saw us in real life, you'd be really surprised to hear that because we're both really short. Yeah. Um, we did play basketball. And um, we probably started talking about Monday Morning Cooking Club together at the end of 2005. Um, Marilyn is now a Sydney girl, but was born and bred in Perth. And a big part of her life um, is Perth and we have so she has so many beautiful stories about life in Perth. She worked in public relations and that sort of morphed into public relations food and wine which she absolutely loved over the years. She's married to Ronnie and they have two children Eliza and Adam and she joined Monday Morning Cooking Club immediately after we had the conversation. She was one of the founding members and she's been with us all the way through um, and our paths had crossed earlier than that when our kids I think were at preschool together. Um, okay so now I'm going to ask each of you to just tell a little bit about yourself in your own words. Let's go Marilyn do you want to start? Sure uh, so well, Lisa said it in a few words but um, I grew up in Perth in a very very small Jewish community 3,000 people uh, with an older brother five years older than me and uh, my parents are Holocaust, were, were Holocaust survivors. They're no longer with us. And uh, growing up in Perth was like growing up in a tiny little shtetl, a cross between a city and a country town, yeah, country town and a, and a city. And um, moved to Sydney to work in PR and uh, the rest of my life got rolling very, very quickly after that. And I grew up kind of with a food obsessed mother and a food obsessed father as well. And um, and it, it permeated right through our life every day. Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. Maddie, Natalia. Um, well, in a nutshell, um, really, when I think about me, I think what sums me up is family and food. And that's basically it. I love being at home. I love being surrounded by my family. So this COVID situation has actually suited me really well um, I've loved it and I basically live in the kitchen when I'm at home it's like that's where you'll find me um, so that other than what Lisa said I think that really that's who I am and that's my life. Natanya there's just a bit of um, your sounds not coming through properly um, oh. when you speak so I don't know if it's your distance from that. Might Oh, yeah, I think yeah. maybe what it is. Okay. Heard it, but, but, Can you yeah. hear me now? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Okay. okay. Sorry. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, girls. That's just a little snapshot of you two. And I just want to read something um, that I wrote in our first book about me. It's really the same for this discussion today. Okay. I sometimes imagine that I'm living in the wrong century and in the wrong place. I dream of stories of my late grandmother, Hubba Shackle, in Poland. My father describes her cellar as a treasure trove of culinary delights and tantalising aromas, bursting with barrels of freshly pickled cucumbers, vats of pickled cabbage, apples and tomatoes, of schmaltz and pickled herrings and preserved fruits and jams. I dream of her cholent, fried fish and cabbage rolls, the likes of which I will never taste, and of her cheesecake, strudel, freshly baked challah and platzala, which was apparently onion bread. She rolled the thinnest pastry for the most perfect apple strudel without a book in sight. 
many years later, my mother asked her for the recipe, which of course had never been written down. So my mother stood in the kitchen with a measuring cup and scales and measured and weighed every pinch, spoon and glass of sugar, flour and butter before it went into the mix. This was the only time Wilbur's strudel didn't work. The recipe is now long gone, but the story inspired me to want to record our family's recipes to ensure that at least some of them are passed on to the next generation. So I just want to play you a little video. You'll have to bear with me and the technical side, but I will do my best here to make this happen. So just bear with me for one second. Invert it as soon as it comes out of the oven. It stays upside down until it's cooled, and that's how it keeps all that height and airiness. So now, when I take it out, and we just put it out of the pastry, and there's our cake. And then we take the knife and gently cut around the bottom. And put it onto a plate. Ta da! And then invert it onto whatever your serving plate is. It's such an amazing feeling to know that she's not here, but she's living on through her food. It was my childhood cake. I'd come home from kindy at lunchtime, and my mother would plonk me on the kitchen counter and I would have a plate and yellow cake, is what I call it. My mother put a dollop of cream with everything. That's the Hungarian thing to do. And just a really good cup of tea. The kitchen is, it was a special bonding place for me. And I still talk to her there. It's a bit ridiculous that I'm making myself cry. <laughs> <laughs> it always, you know, as many times as I hear you tell that story, I, I just, yeah, it warms my heart, I must say. Um, okay, so there's a sound coming from somewhere. I'm not sure where it is behind one of us. Is there anything going on somewhere? Oh, okay, are we all sounding all right? Okay, all right. I don't know what that is. Anyway, okay. I can hear it too, but I don't know. I don't think it's from here. Uh, I can't hear it. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's move on. Okay. We all know that um, mothers and grandmothers and aunties are a really essential part of the food that we eat and cook. Um, and we all heard through 15 years now of collecting recipes time and time again, someone learning on their mother's knee or standing at their grandmother's side in the kitchen. Um, and I, I've got memories of everything that was cooked in my house, whether it was the Gedemp steak. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. It's like leftover roast beef or barbecue meat that was then put in the oven with fried onions on top of it and cooked. Um, or my Auntie Myrna's boimel tort, which was this cinnamon cake made with oil that we've never been able to replicate. Or my Auntie Leah's cheesecake that also will never surface again. So girls, let's get on to you now. I just want to start with your childhood memories. Um, Natanya, what's your strongest childhood memory with food? I think um, one of my strongest and actually my earliest memories of when I was very young, um, and, and it's so clear that I remember so clearly standing by my mother in the kitchen and hearing and watching the Kenwood um, whirring around while she was baking something. And I, I just have this image of me holding a wooden spoon. So I must have been given it to hold and just waiting to lick the bowl. Um, and it, it really, that image has stayed with me like till now forever. Um, and I think it was the beginning um, of my mother instilling in me a, a love for baking, um, which I really, really have. And um, that's probably my earliest memory. I, I remember all through my childhood, 
us never having packet um, biscuits or bought cakes in the house. My mother baked everything. I longed to have um, a Monte Carlo and uh, what would and those the Swiss roll cake packet cakes that you could buy. I don't know if everyone can remember those. Um, and no, we, we didn't have those. We, we had what my mother baked. And it's funny now because I've actually passed that on to my children. I, I, I just like shake my head, at, you know, at, at that, the aisle full of biscuits in the, in the supermarket because why would I buy that? I could make something so much better. Um, so it's a tradition that's been passed on to my children as well. But um, other than that, I remember my, mom, my dad barbecuing on weekends. I remember um, my mum making um, slabs of Louise cake, which is, you know, like a short, like a shortbread base and with her homemade, a layer of homemade jam and then a meringue top cut into squares and they would be sitting in the, in the Tupperware um, on the kitchen counter. I remember that very clearly. What else did she make? Um, her Lokschenkugel um, was always around. Um, which actually was an adaption from my grandmother's recipe. Um, and what about, what about on birthdays? Like what, what was the birthday thing in your house? Always, always, every, every year for me and my two brothers, we would get a, a butter cake layered, um, filled with cream and jam in the middle, a chocolate icing on the top, and our happy birthday personalised message piped in cream on top of the chocolate. That was just standard every year for all of us, um, which was a wonderful thing. And it's funny because my mum made it look so easy. Um, but I remember when my kids were young, I thought, oh, you know what, I'm gonna replicate and do the same thing. So I made the cake, iced the cake, filled the, the bag with ready to pipe the message, thinking that I'll just do it like she just did it. and. It was actually a really difficult thing to do. I couldn't do it, and she was actually very good at it. So I'm still working on that. <laughs> um, and the other thing I remember from birthdays every year, which I loved, was um, my mum would make the little cupcakes, the butterfly cupcakes. So you'd make a cupcake and you'd cut the circle out of the top and make two little wings that sat in cream, um, and then she'd dust it with icing sugar. That was that. They were delicious and um, very strong uh, childhood memory. I don't actually know how to do that cupcake thing. Maybe we can get your mum to come into the kitchen one day and yeah. teach us how to do it. Oh, I and, can show you. Yeah. And a, and a piping lesson would be good. I also can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Marilyn, what about you growing up? What, what do you remember about food in your house? I have a ridiculously strong sense of memory for my very, very early childhood. And of course, yellow cake, custard chiffon cake figures very strongly in there. Um, I was, I would have been um, four or five because kindergarten only went till 12 o'clock. In those days, we lived in a suburb quite far from the, relatively far from the Jewish community. There was like a small cluster of Jewish families that lived near Floriot Beach. And um, I would come home from kindy and there would be a slice of yellow cake on the Formica countertop. And um, and I would sit on the countertop with my slice of yellow cake while mum prepped dinner. And the whole of my life was in the kitchen. It was either in the kitchen with mum or food shopping with mum or, yeah, or, or cooking with her. And um, I, I don't know if this was what life was like in the 60s um, in the East, but we actually had in Floriot Park once a week this truck, like the market grocer truck, um, apart from milk and bread deliveries. This guy came, he was like a mobile green grocer, and we'd run down to the bottom of the driveway and there would be the fruit and veggie man and you would buy it off the back of his truck. And it was set up with like tiered stand. I try and get in the shape there, like tiered stands, literally like a mobile shop, not like boxes of food. So that was very exciting. Um, Fridays were very exciting because Tolkien Bakeries delivered a challah, but I was allowed a fresh and still warm horseshoe roll. Remember pre-bagels, horseshoe mm. rolls? Um, and I think about my parents. My mum was Hungarian and my dad was Polish. So they came from quite cold, 
Eastern European, I mean, it gets very hot in summer, but it's not where you grow oranges and lemons. So we had an orange tree, a lemon tree, and we had six or eight passion fruit vines and an almond tree, but we never got an almond crop because the magpies liked them so much. So, but I remember mum picking the passion fruits and making passion fruit jam. And I imagine for a Hungarian immigrant, that must have been the most exotic thing in the world to do. Um, so yeah, I, I, I have masses of memories. As I got older, I was doing other things that you girls have heard about, like shelling walnuts and grinding poppy seeds and yeah. Yeah, and we went we went food exploring, you know, I would just be schlepped around in the back of the Vauxhall car all over Perth looking for European ingredients because Perth was quite quite Anglo in its own way. Um, let me just ask you now, because I haven't, and, and I just think everyone would like to know just about quickly your heritage, each of you, um, where your parents and grandparents came from. Natanya, do you want to start? Um, yeah, my... On my dad's side, um, my grandparents were Russian, Shanghai Russians. So um, my grandmother was born in Harbin, in Harbin, China, and my grandfather was born in Russia. Um, and then they moved to Shanghai and had my dad and then eventually came to Australia. Um, my mum's parents were Polish English. My grandmother... Um, I think was born in, in I think she was born in, she was born in Poland but when she was a baby came to England and grew up there. So um so that that's my heritage. And I and I grew up as Lisa said on the north um and then to the east but I feel like I had quite a I mean except for all the traditions um I had quite a Aussie um upbringing as in um barbecues on the weekend and white bread sandwiches and that sort of thing. Um, it's funny you say white bread sandwiches because so many people's stories that we read, they, um, and I think maybe you were one of them, Marilyn, I can't remember, you know, they went to school with like chopped livers on rye bread yeah. and all they wanted was a Vegemite sandwich on white, you yeah. know, and they couldn't get it. Um, Marilyn, tell us about your heritage. All I wanted was white bread. <laughs> um, <laughs> And grated carrot. Oh, my God. Um, okay, so my mum, Hungarian. Her hometown is actually 15 minutes across the border now in Romania. Um, and, but her grandparents were from Czechoslovakia. So it's very much that Austro-Hungarian empire. And in her family, um, it depends on which, which person you ask. They're Czech, Hungarian or Romanian. Um, so that's mum and... Um, and dad Polish and they both moved to Australia after the war my dad came to Perth and then went to Melbourne and then went back to Perth and my mother's papers actually came through to New Zealand and she worked as a nurse or trainee nurse in New Zealand for a couple of years and then she did this very long slow crawl she went New Zealand Sydney Melbourne Adelaide Perth fell in love with Perth met my father um created a family of friends, if that makes sense, and, you know, people we call auntie and uncle and, um, and her own family. Hmm. Yeah. And I can say, I, um, which isn't about food, but, but it's quite unusual for people, is that there was this band of Polish Holocaust survivors in Perth who all became wool buyers, and my father was one of those, and um, he would live in the Wuben pub, three hours drive from home, from Monday to Thursday every week. It's a little country town, a one street town um, on the wheat belt of West Australia. And so, you know, it was a it was a a hard a hard life that really um got us educated and got a great start in Australia. Yeah, amazing. Amazing stories. Um just back to food and growing up and what we eat. Um in my house and I've really forgotten half of it. We used to have barbecue on Monday. My dad was the barbecue master. And then we used to have chicken livers on Wednesday night, which were always the same, cooked the same way, except there's one change. So some usually it was chicken livers fried in onions like every Jewish household did. But when we were going to Weight Watchers at various times when we were teenagers, we had the chicken livers cooked in tomato juice, which was oh. just hilarious, actually, when I think about it. Sorry, Mum, I know you're listening. What? Um, 
<laughs> and then and then sometimes more thing I know. <laughs> Have I never? <laughs> I haven't heard that one before. <laughs> I'm sure my sister's in hysterics who's listening too. Um, and then Sunday mornings were always bagel and salmon and cream cheese always. And then Sunday night, like so many Jewish families, we went out for Chinese. So girls, what, what were your households like? Like what was the all things? Natty, do you want to go first? Yeah, we had a, I don't remember all during the week, but I do remember a Sunday night tradition was Heinz canned tomato soup with um, white rice cooked in it or I don't know if she cooked it in it or put it out I think that was to yeah. like just to bulk out the, the meal but that was our Sunday night dinner I think in front of the TV um, I remember that very clearly um, we also had we didn't go to Chinese every Sunday night but for special occasions or, or um, like just when we ate out in a restaurant it was the neighborhood Chinese restaurant and I remember so clearly those those prawn um, rice crackers things that you that you got on the side of your plate they were pink yeah. I mean, disgusting <laughs> um, but we loved those with our with our short wonton soup and um, and the crispy lemon chicken they, it was that was that was the special the special meal that we'd have yeah 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 Marilyn uh, um, I think between Monday to Thursday when Dad was away, it wasn't that routine. It was very much, you know, we sort of became a bit eclectic and it was whatever Mum felt like. But um, paprikash, goulash, rice paprikash were just on complete total rotation. Like, you know, any day, the pre Mum had a pressure cooker and so a goulash that might take me two hours to make in Sydney, she'd have done in 45 minutes. She was like a pressure cooker queen. Um, um, Wednesday afternoons, I should. I wonder if my brother would remember this, but we used to go to swimming lessons straight after school at Beatty Park Swimming Pool and Dad was still away and obviously Mum took it as a bit of a shortcut. We kept kosher at home or only had kosher meat. We were that kosher. And... Um, but Wednesday nights after swimming lesson, we were allowed a meat pie from the kiosk at BD Park Swimming Pool. And I thought that was the best thing, apart from white sliced bread. Like that was, whoa, <laughs> huge. Yeah. Um, the closest thing to takeaways was the Greek fish and chip shop, the fish and chipper. Um, and I think eventually they started doing barbecue chickens in the fish and chip shop. That was a bit exciting. But... Um, the real routine hit on the weekends. So Friday night was absolutely, you know, I guess like all of us, like it was just the most important night of the week and it was the same meal every single week. My mother made the most exceptional chicken soup. Um, so it was always, she came from a very religious background in Hungary, so there was always fish on the table because there's something about Doug and the numerology of Shabbat or something. So there was always fish not necessarily gefilte fish, but always some sort of fish. Then chicken soup with lakshan, always roast chicken, absolutely always. Um, roast pumpkin, two other vegetables, some sort of dessert if we had visitors, but otherwise straight onto a slice of cake. It was really standard to have a five course Shabbat dinner. Saturday lunch was always repeats of the chicken. Saturday night, was, it feels like it was yesterday, was always whooshed and salad because who could be bothered cooking after all of that? So it was sliced bush and pressed beef. I don't know if you guys had pressed beef. It was like a kosher butcher cold cut. Um, and then Sunday lunch, Dad always made a barbecue. So you had your week set out. It's funny how family did that. I mean, we had the same Friday night menu as well. And and it's funny, the three, the, my, myself and my siblings, we sort of, we all make egg and onion, which is the thing my mother learned from her mother and all that sort of thing, from her mother-in-law, actually. So every family has its traditions, and that's what I love about food and passing down the recipes. Nadie, what were your Friday nights? Um, it's funny you say the egg and onion, Lise, because our, our family was also very traditional, um, and when it came to the, being Jewish, it was really about being Jewish 
via the food. So Friday night um, were always um, egg with hala, but it was egg and mayonnaise. And it's and and that's always been a tradition. My mum's always made that um, until Monday Morning Cooking Club came along and Lisa and her family introduced our family to egg and onion, um, which then became also a new favourite for us. Um, I and that. I know, isn't that beautiful? Like, I yeah. love how traditions, like they don't only just go down a family, they go sideways as well, which is beautiful. Um, so, so that was very, very um, always there. I remember my Russian grandmother made the most, everything she made was incredible, but the most incredible gavilta fish. Um, and my mother does a brilliant job now. Um, and, but I, I just have a childhood memory of my grandmother's gavilta fish and we have never been able to reproduce it like she did. Um, my mother and I we've tried and tried and tried. Um, there was just something about it and we've lost her recipe. So so that's just something that's buried in my head forever. Um, that was very special. Yeah, it's sad. It's actually so sad, isn't it, when recipes are gone yeah. and you can get them back and there's nothing you can do. Hmm. Um, okay, so I know that, Marilyn, you alluded to um, grinding the poppy seeds and can you and that sort of thing. Can you just talk about for a minute, please, the stories of the jobs you and your brother were given growing up? Because I just loved to hear them. <laughs> um, well, Mark and I both really participated a lot in the kitchen and, and he's also a very good cook. Um, and he's married to a very cool cook, so there's a bit of competition there. Um, but Mark and I would be frying the schnitzel, and we had schnitzel at least once a week. Um, so until I was old enough to work with the hot oil, I was in, I started with flouring, and then Mark would do the rest, and then I would flour and egg and breadcrumb, and Mark would fry, and then eventually I was allowed to fry. And uh, that was, you know, you couldn't wait to be allowed to fry because then you could break off the little sticklers and burn your tongue, yeah, you know, on, exactly. on this super hot, super crunchy schnitzel. I and, still do that. <laughs> oh, my God, it's just so good. So that was that was um, working with Mark in the kitchen and, and uh, we Mark and I had fun playing around in the kitchen as teenagers as well and getting creative. Um, and then mum was really an exceptional baker and she was a night owl. She was a bit of an insomniac. So she would she would make things very late at night. But in terms of me helping her, uh, she was she really thought that everything had to be done the long way and the old way to have a perfect result. And maybe that's why my food doesn't taste the same as hers, because I I buy the best quality walnuts in Sydney as far as I'm concerned. But for my mother, that would not have been good enough. And she would buy the walnuts in the shell. And um, the fastest way, I can tell you from experience, is to sit in the backyard with a brick and a hammer and just <laughs> smash the walnuts until you can get out the, um, the walnut hearts out of it, uh, kernels. And so I would do that. And then when I was about Mm, probably, I don't know if I was 14 or 16, but my mum did go back to Romania on her own and she came back from Hungary with a cast iron poppy seed grinder. You know, one of those ones that you screw onto the bench top? We had one for nuts already anyway, a different one. Uh, but this my, was a... Um, my grandmother had one and that's what she made her chopped liver with. Yeah, yeah. Not the same yeah. thing? I like a food grinder. I like a food yeah. grinder, but it goes around, around like that. This is a nut grater or a grater like that. But the poppy seed one was a very specific, really heavy cast iron. And I would have to um, just grind poppy seed because you couldn't buy them ground in Perth. And then years later, one trip to Sydney, I decided that mum should teach me her poppy seed strudel. Um, and I went to to the local Hungarian shop and bought ground and she was very upset with me and because she was really pedantic and um, I said to her we'll taste them and she said she took a taste and she said no they're old 
I said, well, you know, too bad. This is how we're doing it. You know, that mother daughter dialogue thing. And so we made the struggle and I said to her afterwards, how does it taste? Are you happy with the result? And she said, it is okay. <laughs> <laughs> like it's not it really up to her standard. So we did that. We, um, we used to go, we, when we were driving around Perth, there was this fan, when I became like about 18, it became quite trendy. But in, in Northbridge, there was this Italian cafe called Pesca, Pescatori's, it was called. And after we'd driven around, we would go in there and have either a lemon granita or a lemon sorbet. And you just couldn't get that stuff in 1970. I don't know. I mean, in Sydney, you would have had to have gone to Haberfield. And mum would just wait in the car because she couldn't get a parking spot and send me in. And there'd be these, they were probably gorgeous Italian men, but they were playing cards and smoking. And I was terrified. You know, I was like, run in there, run out again. We had a great time. <laughs> Sounds good. It sounds good. Natty, have you got any, did you have any special jobs? I don't remember, um, other than licking the bowl, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, do. I don't remember doing a lot in the, in the kitchen. Um, I, I do have a, a, a memory of helping with the schnitzels, um, but like, like Marilyn was talking about, but that's about it. I don't remember being very active in in the kitchen with my mum um so she, she did know. it well I guess yeah yeah I, I, I did Marilyn as yours did um let me just read something um it's a story from a man called Benjamin David who was in our very first book and um his parents were born in Burma and then they moved to Indonesia because it was um very difficult to be living in Burma if you were of Indian descent at that time and when the Japanese invaded Indonesia in 1942, he was four years old and they then spent three years in a prisoner of war camp. Um, and this is what he writes. Um, Luckily, my mother was a wonderful cook and in the camp, she was appointed head of the kitchen. I gained my love of cooking from her. I came to Sydney in 1961 and my parents followed one year later. We were so happy to be together again. When I first came to Australia, I used to write home for cooking instructions and mum gladly sent me her recipes. My favourite food of hers was a simple dish of snake beans with chicken. Now every time my wife makes it for me, I am transported right back to Indonesia. Um, so there are so many stories of people who are so connected to cooking through their mothers and, and it's such a, an amazing link that there is. So I'd just like to um, hear from you guys about... Um, what is the what are the most important lessons that your mothers taught you over the years? Natty, do you want to go first? Yeah, well, I I think really the she what she's really given me is is as I said before the love of the love of baking um, that's really come from her and it's a, a beautiful gift that she's given me and I think it's something that I've also am now passing on to my children which is which is wonderful. Um, I also think from from my grandmothers, I was thinking about it, um, and particularly my my Russian grandmother, whose table was always laden with food, and she was the most incredible cook. Um, and she really loved us by feeding us. Um, that was her way of giving us love with food, which I didn't understand as a child, of course. Um, but I, I think from her, I've, I've learned, she's given me a lesson of generosity and abundance, um, which, which, is, which is a beautiful thing. And um, mm. I think so combined with that and with, with what my mother's given me, I, I, it, like, I, I feel very fortunate. Um, I've had, yeah. had beautiful role models in my life mm. um, when it comes to food. It's lovely. So lucky too. Um, yeah, Mar very lucky. Hmm. Marilyn, what did your mother teach you? Ah, so much, eh? Hey? <laughs> <laughs> uh, she taught me that anything homemade is a health food. Yes, uh, so yeah. true. Yeah. Not mine too. Yeah, yeah, she yeah. was a complete health nerd. And uh, the thing about the book, it's like they were verboten. Gork biscuits were verboten in our house. I'm so with you, Natty. Um, yeah. She, 
she would often make pastry very late at night, like at 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night because it had been 40 degrees during the day and too hot to make pastry and she, she was too much of a night owl so she wasn't going to wake up and do it early in the morning. And I'd be swashing for my, you know, school certificate or whatever it was and she would stop me from studying because that's the important thing in life is how to make pastry. And so she would pull me out of the bedroom from my books and make me touch the pastry and just get a feeling for it. And uh, I actually didn't start making pastry until I was working with you girls because I considered mum so much better at it. You know, she never had a recipe for it. Just, I don't know, just make an eggshell of water, an eggshell of, you know, crack the egg and then an eggshell of water. So, um, and it was really funny, and I know you girls have heard me say this, but quite often when I touch something now, it's like, yeah, that's like mum's. Or I taste something and I say, oh, that's just like, that tastes like mum. You always laugh at that, Lisa, right? Because it sounds like I've been eating her up. <laughs> that tastes like mum. And um, and I still go through phases where I have to put her photo back in the kitchen and talk to me. At the start of isolation or lockdown or whatever we want to call it, when life was pretty stressful, I pulled her photo back out and I had it next to me in the kitchen and she would just smile at me kind of knowingly this photo while I'm cooking in the kitchen she's like yeah you've nailed it you're okay you know so it was really cool mm. yeah. um I just remembered something else Lise that my mother also I think it's a, a really something special that I carry through um to my family is my mum um really showed me the importance of tradition um Mm. as in you know simple things like friday night dinners um and getting the family together and sitting for for whatever whatever meal it is but sitting together on friday night rosh hashanah dinners um you know pesach they're all, always the same and um you know we're not overly religious but we 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 have kept the traditions um and i, I think that's i think that's a beautiful thing to pass on to your family and then and hopefully your kids will pass on to their families. I think that the three of us or all of us um, are in the same, I think we agree. I mean, we're, we're all, I think, products of our families' traditions over the years. And I know that we all have Shabbat dinner, the three of us. And I remember meeting some American friends a couple of years ago and being so surprised. I gave a friend a colour cover as a gift because I stayed at her house and she opened it up and she said, oh, really nice but I'm sorry to tell you we don't do Shabbat mm -hmm. and I was just mortified that a Jewish family didn't do Shabbat because for me all all my friends all of you, you guys and all your friends and family everyone does Shabbat so for me it's a given um and we're that's all very right. lucky and that's a treasure and and I do love that we make the same food every week because it just, it just makes it mm -hmm. beautiful it really does um I love the stories you tell Marilyn also about um when you moved from Sydney to Perth, from Perth to Sydney, what mm -hmm. your mother did. And I just want to read something quickly. Um, Frida Abram, who was in our first book, she moved away from her mother um, who was in Melbourne and she lived in, came to Sydney as a young woman. And this is what she said. Our mother missed us terribly, so would visit three times a year, always bringing her trusty worn out bag, bulging with our favourite dishes, the filter fish, peloshki and almond pork. These are the three dishes that remind me so much of her. Um, Marilyn, I just would love to hear your stories about that. <laughs> Do you want to hear the schnitzel story? I do. <laughs> <laughs> so when the kids were really young, um, you know, my mum was 70 when Adam was born. So she was an older, she was an older mother and then she was an older grandmother. And she was still very high energy. And um, she used to send us home schnitzel. We'd go to Perth and she'd always send home this packet of schnitzel that we had a meal when we got off the aeroplane in Sydney and God forbid that, you know, maybe she could squeeze one more meal of Yolan's food into her grandchildren, you know, just push one more in. And um, it used to really annoy me. I probably miss it now, to be honest, but it used to really annoy me. And one trip I spat the dummy and uh, can you imagine me doing that? And, um, and said, no, look, you shouldn't be working that hard you slave, you know, you slave yourself away. Food's not that important. And uh, I got on the airplane without the schnitzel. And two days later, the doorbell rang and it was Australia Post. And she posted us the schnitzel. 
and, um, I never refused to take the schnitzel again. <laughs> she won. She won, and that was it. Yeah. And and I know that when she visited you, um, you made it, especially once you started collecting recipes for Monday Morning Cooking Club, you decided it was time to document um, her yeah. recipes. So yeah. can you talk about so, that? So, in fact, what happened was I ate so much Hungarian food um, till the, and, uh, and, you know, yeah, Hungarian and or Jewish food until I was about 14 or 15 that I just started rebelling uh, against it, I guess, and started saying, I'm not going to eat any more meat or whatever. And, and so in the end, it was a bit of a flip where mum and I started cooking different food in our kitchen. And um, and now tell me what the question was again, Lisa. I've just gone blank. <laughs> she used to come and visit um, to Sydney and, and what did you do to make sure you... Oh, yeah, so then I lost touch of those recipes. Thank you. I knew I was going somewhere. I lost touch of those recipes and she'd given me some of the cakes and things when I first moved to Sydney. But then through the project, through Monday Morning Cooking Club, I realised that there was a whole load of recipes that I didn't have. And if we were capturing all these other beautiful recipes from other people, I should capture mums. And so it was the days before good phones on the good cameras on the phone. And one one day out of the two weeks, there would be a moment in time where mum was able, I don't know if the word is able, but you know, it's hard to, to be slowing down with the weighing and measuring and everything, you know, you need you need to be in a, the right frame of mind to break it down slowly. And I was patient enough and Eliza was at home. So mum would teach me how to make something every time she stopped, you know, making the strudel dough or um, uh, there was another one that she made also, um, knockadol she made for us, which is the eggshell of water. And I would say, stop, 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 I have to measure it. And then Eliza had the camera and I would write down the recipes and weigh and measure everything. And I wrote them down um, and then typed them up kind of in Hungarian English, <laughs> like the equivalent of franglais, whatever that is. And um, and they are my most treasured documents on my computer with embedded photos that Eliza took of the two of us cooking. Mm. That was very clever to take to take yeah. photos as well because I did the same thing with my grandmother and her chopped liver, which I which she used to mince in that mincer that I t talked about. Yeah. And I remember standing with her in my mother's kitchen, thinking, you know we have to get this recipe written down and she made it and I watched her and step by step wrote yeah. it, and I wish I would have taken photos. Yes. Oh, so wishes, you know, we've all got them. My my auntie Myrna was the best cook ever. Like really you'd go to her house and just like um your mother did to you and your grandmothers did to you, Natty, um yeah. she would just feed us, feed us, feed us some cake and biscuits and whatever. And she wrote down like I started collecting recipes just before she died, so I really didn't have that many, that much time to put them I needed. And she made the most amazing butter chiffon cake, and she wrote down the recipe for me. And I got it on like one of those, um, you know, medication notepads that I don't know why yes. older people have yes. them. And <laughs> just the ingredients, no method, nothing. And I don't know if anyone who knows chiffon cakes knows that they're traditionally made with oil, not with butter. Didn't say if the butter was melted. Didn't say if it was cream. Like nothing. And I have tried to make it probably, and, and you guys have tried also. Oh, bye. Yes. <laughs> just can't get it right. And it's, it's sort of heartbreaking because if I thought about it at the time, I would have sat down with you in the kitchen and gone through it step by step and done and done exactly what you did, Marilyn. So it's sad that that opportunity is yeah. gone for so many of us. Yeah. Um, hmm. So, um, okay, I think that we might actually pause there for a minute. We can come back to some more there are no questions. Are there any questions from anyone out there? Please feel free to type them. Um, we're the girls. I'm sure, are very happy to answer anything. Um, and if there are no questions, we'll just carry on chatting for a few more minutes. Okay. All right. Um, okay. I, I did want to say, Lisa, um, like your Auntie Myrna, um, my Russian grandmother, who was the most amazing cook, I have such a strong memory of one particular taste. I can see her giant walnut cake covered in a coffee buttercream. And she used to pipe um, like spaghetti swirls all over the top of it. I can see it so clearly. And I have such a strong memory of the taste of it. We 
I've lost the recipe. I've never been able to re replicate it. But I just know what it tastes like and I just wish, wish that I could find that cake again and taste it again. It's such a, it just takes me back to her so strongly. Um, and it, it's so sad that we don't have it, that we've lost it. I wonder if I can't give it to my children. Yeah, and I wonder if in our generation, because, you know, our parents and grandparents weren't in the digital age, obviously, things really, it wasn't as easy to write things down because they're normally written on a recipe card or a piece of paper. Mm. I think nowadays, so I think we're missing sort of maybe a quarter of our recipe heritage is lost. Maybe yeah. half. And I feel that maybe for us and our kids, um, everything, you know, on Google Drive, it's all there. And there's a million videos, especially of us making these dishes. Yes. So yeah. they've got it going forward. Um, I, can I ask you both, what, are there any other dishes over the years where the recipe wasn't written down that you're just kicking yourself or really upset about? I, um, I, my mother, I, I don't know whether other people are like this. You know, Perth can get, it can be 40 degrees for 10 days in a row. And we still had to have soup every night. Um, and and uh, on a really, really hot time, it moved on to gazpacho when we moved off the hungo food. Um, but my mother made this Hungarian potato soup and I have never mastered it. She never wrote it down. I didn't get the recipe because it was... Like, who needs a recipe for soup, really? You know, I got the cakes, but who needs a recipe for soup? And I, I actually tried to make it a couple of weeks ago for um, for Eliza, Ronnie and me, and I just I just can't get it. I just, and all it is is onion, potato, carrot, celery and chicken stock. And I still can't get it. Yeah, there's something about a particular taste from... Um, a taste memory, yeah. My mother, my late mother-in-law made the best chicken schnitzels and I just cannot replicate the flavour and I don't know what it is and I can't ask her. So it's it's a shame. Natty? Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, for me it was definitely the the walnut coffee cake um, and same grandmother, her gefilte fish. Those are the two things that I really, really wish that I could somehow replicate now and, and just can't yeah my dad made the gefilte fish and the canadian wow that's amazing wow. because there was this kind of haranguing between polish and hungarian and the polish wanted it really sweet you know and so um his gefilte fish were out of this world but probably because if mum had made it she would have been quite budget conscious about the fish because you're going to mince it anyway Whereas for dad, it was a twice a year event for Pesach and Rosh Hashanah. And he would go to the fish markets and buy, I don't remember when I was very little, but, but when I was older, he'd be buying Red Emperor and Barramundi and like the most expensive fish you could find, West Australian dew fish, DHU, um, which you can't even buy over here. It's about, nowadays it's 80 or $90 a kilo, I reckon. So he would buy this amazing fish. Like how can you go wrong when the raw ingredients are that good? and make the most beautiful gefilte fish, yeah. So so talking about what parents teach teach children, um, I'd love to hear from both of you about what you've taught your children. I'm sorry about my dog barking. Um, um, I know that I've taught, I've got four kids and some have learnt more things than others. Some have picked it up by osmosis, I guess, and some have a passion for it. But I spent last week teaching um, our 29-year-old son how to cook. He asked me for lessons. So I obviously failed in that regard because he learned nothing from me. So, so girls, I'd love to hear from you. What have you taught your kids and how have you gone about that? Um, well, I think a lot is, is via osmosis, as you say. Um, but I've definitely passed on a sweet tooth to my children um, so, and, and a love of baking. And it's funny because um, just yesterday, um, my daughter was invited out to someone's house for dinner and we were out and I said, oh, we can just stop and get something. She goes, no, 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 I'll go home and I'll, can I just quickly make up a batch of chocolate chip cookies to take? I was like, of course. And I was thinking about it when I was going, just thinking about what we were going to be talking about today last night and I was thinking, that's what I've taught her. Exactly that. That you that the, the and which actually has come from my mother and, um, 
where you bake, you don't buy. And my grandmother, um, you know, the, the thread of generosity of giving food um, and loving through food. So I, I love how I can see that now passing down to my kids. And even my son, you know, for my birthday, he turned up to um, our house this year for my birthday and he made me a batch of bagels, you know. Um, so I, it, I can see what I'm giving them, um, a love for food and a love for cooking, which, which is great. Mm. 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 Um, I, think, I think my kids have got it through osmosis. They both enjoy cooking, but in a completely and utterly different way to me. Um, they definitely both grew up baking butter cakes with me and, um, and helping a lot with that stuff. And yet I don't think either of them are bakers and I don't think either of them have got sweet teeth, tooth. Um, um, but I, it's funny, I, I do recall quite a few years ago now, what, um, for everyone who doesn't know, my son lives in the USA and so um, in America. So when Adam was still in Sydney and he wasn't living at home, he called me at about nine o'clock from his mobile phone and he said, I've just made a, a huge container of curry I'm taking it to a friend's house whose father's just passed away. And uh, it was quite amusing. Not amusing, it was heartening because that friend wasn't Jewish and he had, you know, that was just what you do. It doesn't matter if your friend's Jewish or not Jewish or whatever. And, um, and I think also when he first moved to America and we were looking at apartments where he could live, he would look at little studios and he'd say, no, I can't, no, that won't do it, can't fit a dining table. And I thought that was very interesting that, you know, that that concept of bringing people around a table was so important. Um, Eliza is a very intuitive cook. Her food tastes delicious, but she just goes to the fridge and goes, you know, what's in the fridge and makes something and it's really yummy, whereas I'm a really kind of pedantic. I like to weigh and measure and, and I love, that's why I love baking. I love the challenge of it. So she's just a really different cook to me. But, yeah interesting um i think we're just about out of time and i want to finish i want to ask marilyn to just tell my favorite story of all time and i think i've heard it eighteen thousand times um it's about um the chiffon cake that you saw in the beginning and it's it's the story of how we got that amazing chiffon cake okay so would you mind just sharing that story before okay. we start off okay all right so um so my mother's next door neighbor from her hometown, Nodj Karoi, which is now Kare, um, lived in Sydney and, and they were very, very close. And Eva Grunstein, her orange cake is in our, our orange chiffon is in our first book and it is sensational. And Eva was, if my mother was an, a fabulous baker, Eva was the doyen of Hungarian baking. She was exceptional. And, um, and so mum would never allow anyone to have her, her chiffon cake or her strudel recipes because she always provided those to the wheat so fates and school fates in Perth and they were her signature. And she was happy to talk about food forever, but she wanted it that at those fates they were her things and they were her signature. So she never handed out that recipe. And then one trip back to Perth after asking and asking and asking to be able to hand out the recipe, I already had it. Um, I told her about Eva and how all the girls said that her cake was a 10 out of 10. And then I did the whole emotional blackmail that, you know, you probably need to do with Europeans. It's part of the fun. It's like bartering in Thailand, isn't it? So um, so I started saying to her, you really need this legacy and imagine what your grandchildren will do. And eventually I kind of said to her, look, let's get blunt. You're not going to be here forever. Let's get this recipe in print. And she said yes. And I was very, very excited and couldn't wait to ring the girls. And then um, the conversation ended and she turned around to me and she said, so Ava's cake got a 10 out of 10. Does that make my cake an 11? <laughs> And um, and I think her cake is an eleven, actually. I love it. It actually, yeah. it actually, is an eleven that custard chiffon cake, and it's so amazing that we not only put it in our first book, but we put it in our most recent book now for something sweet because it is an iconic part of our collection, and it's like our 
It's our poster girl cake, I think. Um, so I think on that note, we will um, finish our chat. And I just want to thank you girls so much for coming along and doing this um, with me. It's been so much fun. Honestly, we could we could just talk for hours. If only I had a piece of cake and a nice cup of tea. We love it. <laughs> yeah. um, so thank you, girls. It's been really wonderful. And I just want to remind everyone that there are so many incredible things going forward on the Denera website. And just have a look. Go on to Denera and see what's coming up. In the food part, I've got a um, Lokshan Kugel demo on Monday at 11 and then more conversations next Thursday at 11 as well about Shavuot. Um, so thank you all. I think we'll sign off now. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thanks for having us. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.